Hello and welcome to another episode of Hey, Not the Face with your host, John Nash, and your producer, me, Steffi Haynes. And today we're going to look at free agency because right now the two biggest, most famous, most popular free agents in the entire sport just left the UFC within the last six months. Now we have talked about UFC contracts in uh, an episode or two back. And we noted a lot of things about Francis Ngannou and Nate Diaz. And we got a lot of stuff right. John, how the hell are you? And talk to me a little bit here. Give me your overall, just your your knee-jerk reaction right now to Francis Ngannou exiting the UFC. Well, first of all, I'm doing good. Thank you for asking. Yes, uh, I th- it's a very eventful last few weeks in MMA. Very th- twist and turns. We were not planning on this, but now it's official that Ngannou is a free agent. And there's been so much news about him being out there that that made this the subject for the week. Uh, I should note though, it's actually not in the last six months. Uh, Diaz only officially became a free agent, I believe, in November. Oh wow! Remember, okay. because they, had, they he had the exclusive negotiating period, yeah, and that's on, they only waived that, I believe, because they probably talks broke down in November. So that was it's it's really recent that this happened. But yeah, we uh we can take a victory lap. I mean, not often. I often get stuff wrong, but we'll ignore the stuff I get wrong. But <laughs> on on these, I was remarkably accurate. I think about a lot of stuff. I wrote an article about Ngannou's contract. I wrote what the offers might be out there for him. The what the UFC could offer. We talked about the contracts, and as much and a lot of people seem to be in denial that he could be a free agent with the sunset clause for a while. Remember that? Mm-hmm. That ended up being true. And then I said he was probably a free agent early December, and you know a lot of people I got some pushback on that. And then it ends up and God was saying he was a free agent in December. And it's not like I'm Nostradamus here or anything, or I'm not you know I'm not making wonder predictions. It, I just read the the document again and again. I should note we're skipping over the fact that I was wrong the first time I said it. I had to correct myself later. So we're we're going to ignore that part. But eventually I was right. And that's the important thing. Eventually I was 100% right. And you were 100% right before the news actually broke. Yes, well I'm gonna, I'm going to run with it. I'm a, I'm 100% right. So, so occasionally you, occasionally I get things right. So you are Nostradamus. <laughs> Nostradamus. Yes, oh. I I like that. I like that take. <laughs> Nostradamus. Okay. Let's go over how we got here, because they both became free agents in different ways because of their very different contracts. Now, you mentioned the sunset clause, and you also mentioned an exclusive negotiating period. Did they both have those? No, Ngannou, because he had the post, the the, the new contracts that, are, that showed up in around 2017, his contract did not have an exclusive negotiating period. Nate Diaz, on the other hand, had an exclusive negotiating period. But what he didn't have, he did not have that sunset provision that Ngannou took advantage of. And so they're, they're very two very different contracts, but they both managed to exit the UFC in almost the same time. So that's a remarkable thing. And uh, I guess we should go over it a little bit for those. We talked about this a lot on the, the our first episode that we ever did on the Hey Not The Face podcast about their contracts. But really briefly, Nate Diaz's contract, he signed the older pre-2017 contract. The reason those contracts are, were changed in 2017 is because of the antitrust lawsuit. The UFC was trying to mitigate any potential damages going forward. And that was the end of the first class period, the start of the second. So they introduced changes in the contract. So we have basically two different classes for that lawsuit. So Nate Diaz, his contract had endless extensions. It could last in perpetuity. He signed a five-fight deal back in 2016 before the second Conor McGregor fight. Six years later, he was still under contract. And the only reason he finally got out of that contract is he demanded a fight. They booked him with uh, booked him with Chimaev, the guy that they refused apparently to book him against anybody else. He asked for a bunch of other fighters. They wouldn't give it to him. They wanted him to fight Chimaev. And Fortunately for, I guess, the, the, the gods are smiling on ideas because right before the fight, he missed weight, grossly missed weight, and he got a new opponent and then ended, ended up leaving the UFC on a victory when obviously the plan was to leave him looking terrible with a beatdown. So that's Nate Diaz. And Gano, on the other hand, won the title, a championship, finished his last fight his contract, but he has a championship clause and a new contract that has a sunset provision that would that ended, I guess, December 9th, he said, to the uh, last year. 
And the only reason that that contract, even though the championship clause has three fights or a year, whatever sooner, it's basically additional three fights. So if you turn down fights in the past, they could have extended that contract six more months every time he turned on a fight. With this new contract, he didn't have to fight anyone. He could sit out an injury. And at the five-year mark, he was a free agent. So that's how we got here, that both these guys, the number one heavyweight in the world, the world's cha- the UFC champion at the time, no longer now stripped, and one of their biggest draws have both entered the market. I need you to clear something up for me because I see reports that say that Nganu was released. Can you clear up if he was released or did he just leave after his contract expired? Well... The UFC and Dana White is that's the purpose of Dana White is to be out there and 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 pivot everything and polish everything in a way that makes the UFC look good. And so for the UFC, for their PR, it looks good to say we released him. Like basically we didn't want him anymore. We couldn't work with this guy. But the truth is, and Nagano confirmed it in a, a, our Awani interview and uh, other sources, his contract was up December 9th. He was free from the UFC to talk to other promotions. The only reason he didn't is he was negotiating with the UFC and he thought it'd be a nice gesture to talk just to them, to not make a big deal about it so they can get a deal done. But truth is his contract was ended. It it was done. And there was no, there was no exclusive negotiating period. He was free to go anywhere else. And the reason the UFC released him, I guess not only look good, but they say we waived also their matching rights. Well, that's, is that that big a move considering you're, we're all pretty sure they can't match whatever he gets because whatever he gets is going to ask for a much less restrictive contract. He's going to demand a much less restrictive contract. And that's something the UFC was that's the reason they couldn't get a contract in the first place. So them waiving the right to match doesn't really mean anything because we know that they're not going to be able to match whatever offer he gets because it's going to be an offer that's unacceptable to the UFC. What do you think that the UFC really offered to him? Uh, well, he talked a bit about home in the Juani interview. He mentioned that he wanted a three fight deal and no extensions and people kind of people, I think latched on to his his comments about I wanted uh you know um uh insurance for all the fighters. I wanted an advocate, uh, you know, which is a co-determination is in Germany they have that, but co-determination where a fighter advocate sits on the board and uh he wanted also sponsors. And people made a big deal about that, but if you listen to the interview, it's pretty clear he made those he requests, but then he threw them out when he when they were shot down. He just wanted to get them on the table. So I don't think those were the stumbling blocks. He had asked for a three fight deal, apparently UFC accepted, but what they wouldn't accept is not the not the other provisions in the contract that restricted them. I'm guessing like the tolling provisions for injuries, you know, the uh, the championship clause, all the things that could add fights or duration if he's still if he's not if he turns down fights or if he's the champion because that's what locks them in. And his whole thing was I want to get my three fights all the way in a year, 15 months, and then move on to boxing at that point. And that was the draw. Now, money-wise, they talked about him offering him more than anyone since Brock, you know, even the highest paid heavyweight more than Brock Lesnar. And people latched on the $8 million amount that Brock Lesnar made at UFC 200, which, of course, you know, again, we should talk, we're the ones that brought that up, pointed that out, because no one else is digging through the lawsuit like we are. They enter the, the documents. So the $8 million figure, I think that's plausible. But in the interview, he talked about, I could have made $8 million, I was offered $8 million against Jones. I think it's... Based on the UFC, the way they operate, my guess is, and and I'm I got a strong feeling about this because I'm usually we've been pretty close to writing a lot of these offers to fighters, is that the amount they're offering them was probably about five million, four to five million a fight, plus an upside on pay per view and across a certain point. So the Ngannou fight versus Jones, because it's a big fight, that's where he might have passed eight or even ten million, but only for a fight of that that size. He's I very much doubt, and I'll try to confirm this week. I very much doubt he was getting eight million guaranteed per fight. In fact, I'm almost sure he was not getting eight million guaranteed per fight. Okay, talk to me a little bit about John Jones's deal here because he just signed an eight fight deal, which to me seems just crazy. Because isn't his wouldn't his contract have been up next year? I mean, that's the thought. He he supposedly had signed that contract in 2019, so next year it would be up. Uh, and so, you know, you listen to, a, a Schaefer, his new agent manager, advisor, whatever, and they are talking on Hawani and they weren't clear. You know, he said it didn't really matter because he already had eight fights still remaining on his deal. 
And so really, this is just a modification. So is it a new contract or just an addendum? And this, the old contract's still in place and you'll be a free agent next year. I got a feeling it's a new contract because that's how the UFC usually operates. So he's a new contract, right? Which means now he's got, it no longer has that, that Nganu potentially a free agent next year. He can't negotiate and claim, you know, hold that above the UFC to negotiate more. He couldn't leave the UFC and fight Nagano in a major fight somewhere else. So, in fact, I think there's a good chance that the timing was because of that. Because Jones signed this new deal with the UFC, they could now release, I put that in air quotations, release Nganu and book the, the gone fight. Because no longer were they terrified that Ngannou's leaving. Our big fear now is that Jones might leave in a year, and this big fight's going to happen outside the UFC. We don't want these big fights that can generate huge amounts of revenue and pay the fighters a lot to happen outside the UFC. So we have Jones locked up. We have one of the two people locked up. Now we're now we're free to no longer negotiate with Ngannou. So I think that's what happened. Regarding Jones' like purse, it's interesting too. Is they you know they claim Jones is the highest paid heavyweight ever. So is he higher paid than Ngannou would have got? If Ngannou signed, would Jones have a high? Would Jones still be the highest paid heavyweight? That to me, that's kind of fascinating. And my only, you know, Jones already was making, you know, around five million a fight before, and but he was asking, remember to fight Ngannou. The the talk was he wanted Deontay Wilder money, and it doesn't sound like he's getting anywhere close to Deontay Wilder money. He's getting good money. He might make if it sells well as a pay-per-view, eight figures with the UFC, which is tremendous for the UFC. It's basically only Khabib who's behind only, you know, Conor McGregor. You're in that class of payout, but it's still a, my, a small amount compared to what a big fight in boxing would make, you know, what Deontay Wilder made against Fury, which was the, which is what Jones was apparently basing on before. So it doesn't look like he got anything close to that. What are their options? Because you've got these uh, these two guys, Nate Diaz and Francis Ngannou. They're in two different weight classes. Nate Diaz has um, the Jake Paul option, you know, because Jake Paul is over at PFL. I have seen people suggest that Francis Ngannou and Jake Paul do things, but I, I don't ever really see that happening. Uh, I I do feel that Jake Paul is smart enough to not do that. I that I that would be that'd be murder. I yeah. mean, there's a there's weight classes for a reason, exactly. and even if Jake Paul's let's say a better skilled boxer at this point because he's been working on it, what the size difference, the force that's generated a guy in the Ganu side, and the amount of punishment he can take is he's so much bigger. Mm -hmm. That that fight would not last. That would be oh my god. I mean, I'd pay to see it though. I I'd I recommend I they do it. <laughs> I recommend they do it. But uh, anyways. Does it feel like Nate has more immediate options that could pay out tremendously because Jake Paul is right there and has been calling for this and there's the rumored war chest of somewhere in the neighborhood of $30 million that the PFL has. Do they throw all of that money or most of that money at Nate Diaz and Jake Paul or do they throw the majority of it out of Francis Ngannou and try and get another heavyweight in there. Tell me the options of these guys because they seem endless. Well, let's go. Since you brought up Nate Diaz, let's do Nate Diaz first, okay. right? So Nate Diaz's options are, you know, he actually has a lot of, actually, I think in some ways Ngannou has more options, even though Diaz is the more immediate pay-per-view attraction, right? For Nate Diaz, the, the big obvious one is already on the table is Jake Paul's called him out. Now, I, what I find kind of interesting about that is uh, someone told me that you, Nate Diaz never lies. To go back to listen carefully what he says, right, and and that's he is sticking to his guns. And he can't. You, you go back and you listen to you know he says out you know about Chamayev and people will call him a ducker. But you 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 go back and listen to some of his comments. Like, You're right. He kind of holds his. He won't. He won't turn down anybody, but at the same time, he has a sense of his own honor and value. And I'm listening to some of his old comments about Jake Paul, and he is not – if you listen to him, I don't think Diaz is like immediately wants to jump into that fight because I don't think he respects Jake Paul. Mm. And it doesn't in, – in Diaz universe, there's a lack of respect. Also, it's like I, I'm making Jake Paul. I'm the guy who has legitimate MMA, you know, uh, combat sports cred. And you're trying to make your bones against me. I got to be compensated because I'm bringing that to the table. I'm putting that at risk against you. You're a you're an influencer. You can go off and do your YouTube videos afterwards. This is what I do. This is my this is my life. So PFL desperately needs pay per view attractions. 
they built this pay-per-view uh, branch, the PFL, because the PFLs, you know, MMA doesn't do much besides the big stars. They 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 kind of followed one and did a lot of like smoke and whistles, you know, smoke and mirrors about, well, you know, all the like the smart cage and the brand and all that stuff. But truthfully, is the Big fights, big fighters are needed to make it. And it's just smart as they realize that they made this pay-per-view division, but now they need pay-per-view attractions to fill the division. And there's really only two major guys out there right now, Nganu and and uh, and Nate Diaz. The problem with PFL and Nganu is they really don't have an opponent for Nganu. I'm sure they'll pay him. We'll get to Nganu in a little bit. I'm sure they'll pay him because they want the, the brand identity with you know having the best heavyweight. But for Diaz, they have an immediate potentially big money-making fight with Jake Paul. But Diaz knows that. He knows this is a money-making fight. He also knows it's it's a lot of it's built on him. So I do think it's very possible he ends up going there. But I think people are going to be shocked at the offer that's going to take. I got a feeling it's going to take like a large, you know, like a $10 million guarantee for Nate Diaz to go in there. Maybe even more guarantee on the side that they're going to eventually fight MMA so he's not left. If he loses in boxing, he never gets a chance to get it back. So maybe they'll have to put an escrow another $5 million to guarantee the MMA fight. But let's say $10 million guarantee. And then they're going to have to give a split to the boxers. But, you know, it's, it, it won't be 50%. Nate Diaz, I, I'm pretty strong... I, I'm pretty sure will not accept like he gets a cut of the 50% of the pay-per-view revenue like they're offering. He's going to be looking at a boxing split. And he's going to want probably even a larger split than Jake Paul because if you listen to his comments, he views himself as kind of the A-side, as the guy that's putting up more risk to fight Jake Paul. So PFL is now going to have to offer him, let's say, a guarantee of $10 million. But if it crosses a certain point, they're probably going to have to give up 70% of the pay-per-view revenue to the two guys in the ring, Jake Paul and Diaz. And they'll probably have to, and Jake Paul will probably have to give up the majority of it, maybe, maybe not a large majority, but let's say 55, 45, I don't know what the split will be, to, to Nate Diaz. And he has a lot of leverage there because PFL needs this fight. They need these fights where Nate Diaz actually has other fights available on the table. Ryzen, remember he posted that photo of Ryzen? Mm-hmm. You know, Nate Diaz, Manny Pacquiao fight is very plausible in Ryzen over the summer. Manny Pacquiao is going to fight in Ryzen. Nate Diaz is an opponent they can bring in. Uh, I don't think the problem for Nate Diaz and that is it's going to be a Japanese-based fight. So it's going to be hard. You know, the, the marketing and stuff in America is going to be hard. So it might not sell a lot of pay-per-views in the U.S. So he might not be able to demand, you know, mega amounts of money there. But it gives him an option. Like, if you PFL aren't willing to deal with me, I can go to Ryzen and get a sizable amount of money to fight Manny Pacquiao in boxing. The other big option, there's one other big option for uh, Nate Diaz. Well, I should say there's there's several small options. He can do promotional work with bare knuckle. I don't think he's going to do bare knuckle boxing, but he can use his name value to get money from these other promoters by showing up and attaching himself to him, kind of like Jake Paul did with saying, I'm the, you know, I'm, I'm representing the PFL, you know, uh, uh, super fight pay-per-view wing, right? Mm-hmm. Diaz can do the same. He can even demand that from PFL that they have to pay him just to even be attached to his name to the promotion. But he can go, you know, market himself to to uh to b- bare knuckle boxing, never box in the ring, but show up and add his name to it. He can also, I mean, he has some there's some photos of him in pro wrestling. I could see that's not gonna pay a lot, but I could see him doing some pro wrestling stuff, even though he is not the guy that looks anything like a pro wrestler. But the big one I think is his biggest piece of leverage is I I'm I very much think the UFC is going to come back to him with an, an offer to come back to the UFC specifically to fight Conor McGregor. And there's a ton of leverage with, with him fighting Conor McGregor there because Nate Diaz is not under contract. Conor McGregor's contract should be up at the end of this year on the based on the sunset clause. On top of that, the UFC's got 2 years left in their ESPN deal going forward, right? Mm-hmm. After after this year there'll be two more years. They've got to convince ESPN that the pay-per-views still sell and make money. Last year, they didn't sell many. They have to spike up those pay-per-view sales to get a better deal from ESPN or anybody else to convince them to just to unload a ton of money uh, on the pay-per-views. So they need a big hit, right? Mm -hmm. What's the, what's the one guaranteed hit they have? Conor McGregor versus Nate Nate Diaz. And, and so they're okay that we need that big hit pay-per-view to show that we can still generate pay-per-view sales. So ESPN's happy. We also know if we don't get these two guys, they can just wait a little while and do it themselves. So we have to offer them basically more than we probably ever offered a fighter in the UFC to do this fight. I I got a feeling that's, what's going to happen. They're going to come back and eventually going to offer both those more than they've offered any fighters in the UFC to have that event in the UFC. But 
he can use that because before that happens, he can tell PFL, you, you've got to give me a pretty good offer because there's always this in the wings. There's always rising in the wings. And so Nate Diaz is a pretty good position. I think, well, I have to hear because we're going to discuss Francis and Ganu in a moment, but based on what you're telling me, it seems like Nate is in the better position right now. Well, I think Nate has the more clear cut, solid, I guess, pot of gold down the rainbow. And his is already built right now. Exactly. The one drawback is I think Ngannou has more options in the fact that he has there's more uses for him for promoters. But yes, two the the person that has the two biggest fights readily available to him is Nate Diaz. There's two and they're the, what's good for him they're not both in one promoter so he can play them against each other. Yeah, and and they're gonna pay immediate big money. Yeah, the the one problem is he's got to get you know he has this leverage, but they're also this is MMA they don't know they don't want to pay that much. And so will they event, but he has options. I think eventually he will get a very sizable deal from someone out of this. Would the UFC allow Nate to do a smaller contract, you know, two or three fights? Conversely, would PFL allow him to do one fight? Just curious. I- I think because it's the big payout, because there's a built-in audience, because we're sure that those fights will probably sell, I think both promotions, both the UFC and PFL, would be willing to do one-fight deals. Really? I, I think in many ways, though, for PFL, it, it might be in Nate's interest to, to make sure it's a two-fight deal because if I first I box him and then there's another big fight in MMA, and if I lose, I get that – maybe even have the option. It's up to me if I want to have that MMA fight. Then I get I can get it back on an MMA fight. Okay. All right. And but you think the UFC would really only uh give them a one fight deal? You think they would actually do that? Well, it it really depends on what's going on with McGregor. If McGregor doesn't sign his contract and they're terrified that McGregor's going to be a free agent too and they don't want that terrified is a strong word, but you know, the idea that those two that's a fight that those two could leave the UFC and probably hold a, a boxing match between the two of them somewhere else and sell a lot, right? Mm. And so they they know that. They know that there's a chance that that fight could be happen outside the UFC and make money. And so the UFC's got to they got to at that point they have they have to ask themselves, do we want to let this really big fight leave the UFC, right? Exit the UFC and and not hold it here and not not you know and not get the benefits with our cable provider ESPN that we're the one that provided them this massive blockbuster pay-per-view event. And so I think that's why I think that point. But again, the the question I have got, uh, with uh, Connor, we don't know his contract should be up, but there is a separate. Remember, we talked about when you retire, there's a, a separate track. That's a five year. There's a five year uh, sunset provision on the retirement as well, which is separate from the, the termination when you're under con when you're active, I guess, or when you're just refusing fights. Did McGregor retire at some point officially with them so they could, that he could get on some sort of supplements to recover from his injury? If that's the case, then it might throw might throw a wrinkle into it because he might not be up at the end of this year. His contract might not be terminated. The sunset provision might not kick up in in November at the end of this year. It might go. It might be later than that. Hmm. Let's say Connor's contract is up next year. And let's say he waits and Nate waits and they, they both become, they're both free agents. Would it be a boxing match though? Or would it be bigger for them to go to a Bellator or to let all of the promotions fight over them for the the biggest contract? Would it, I mean, to me, it seems like that would be the ideal route. Would they really be able to generate a bunch of interest in a boxing match between them? I feel like it would be MMA, but you're the expert here. So I, I mean, I, I mean, to me right now, because the interest in kind of this YouTube boxing, and then you're not worrying about the UFC brand mm-hmm. if you go into boxing. I, I thought it might be boxing because it throw a curve in the whole feud. But it might be MMA too. They might do an MMA event. Uh, they might sign with another promoter and, and make them put up, you know, net, some, you know, some one of these p- promoters that are sitting on a war chest they got from investors, just you know, to put up a ton of money to guarantee it. Or they might hold it themselves. Conor McGregor. They both of them have their own promotions now, right? 
Right. Maybe it's their, you know, it's kind of like, you know, it's a Mayweather promotions, the the money team. They're going to do it themselves. They're going to do what Klitschko did. They're going to, it's going to be promoted by themselves and they'll keep the money. But I do think, I mean, obviously they're such big stars. There's interest that you would find a major partner, broadcast partner that would work with them. A DAZN would work with them. A Showtime would work with them. Someone would work with them mm -hmm. that it would make it much more likely to be a success. And I mean, maybe it doesn't sell as well outside the UFC. Maybe it does half the numbers it does. But again, if it sells one and a half million in the UFC and let's say it sells 800,000 outside the UFC, you're still talking. You've got to guarantee those guys probably 25, 30 million because they know that's what they could make outside the UFC. Wow. And that's for a boxing match? Well, boxing, MMA, whatever, okay. you know, I'm sure you, you can hire people to do the investigate what's going to be more fan interest, to do surveys, polls, find the fans, say what's going to generate more interest and then go that route. I mean, Showtime has those people. Other people have used them, you know, to find that. I mean, that's some weird way of why McGregor uh, uh, Mayweather happened in the first place. Someone looked into it and, and figured out that there was such an interest that this would be a, a massive. They didn't take a guess. They they conducted the, the research and figured out this is going to be a massive hit. There's interest for this, that people would buy it. Wow. Let's talk about Francis Ngannou now. Focus on him. Give me his options because you say he might actually have more options. Tell me why you say that. Well, his options aren't as clear cut like the Jake Paul and, and McGregor that, you know, that there's this obvious big money fights there for him. But he op there's obviously a lot of options because people have already expressed a lot of interest in him. You know, he can go to MMA. He can go to boxing. Well, let's start with the MMA first. Uh, as a promoter, MMA promoters, there's really two big, two big, I think, uh, options from an MMA. I think two serious suitors, and that's PFL and Bellator. Both of them, there's something to be said about signing um, Nganu just for the brand awareness to say, I have the number one heavyweight in the world. And that's worth a lot of money. Like we, we just talked about earlier, my assumption is the UFC was offering him like a $5 million guarantee. To fight, that's not outside the realms of, you know, people say, oh, they, the, these other promoters can't from, afford that. Even if they can't hold on events that generate that kind of money, they're probably willing to pay Ngannou like five million, maybe six million a fight just to say we have the number one heavyweight, right? Just to say that this guy is attached to our brand because it elevates the brand and brings awareness. It's a loss leader for them. So there's that option. With PFL, the problem with PFL is they don't have really any fighters to put against him. So they would be paying him solely on the idea that he's going to bring awareness to the brand. Maybe they make an announcement and say he's going to fight the winner of our heavyweight tournament at the end. That's the that's the big thing you win. <laughs> Doesn't sound like much of a trophy winning their their uh, title, you know, their tournament if that's what you win, a chance to fight in Ganu <laughs> because you're going to get probably murdered. But still, that's what they could offer something like that. Or they can hope, we've talked about before, we can hope that another UFC fighter falls after him like a Stipe Miocic or someone else sees that there, there's a way out of the UFC and they're close to the end of their contract. Maybe their sunset provision and they fall after them. And they can put that on pay-per-view, but that's because PFL needs stars because they need pay-per-view attractions. Even if they only break even or lose money in those pay-per-view attractions, they're going to have to sign them. So, and Nagano is one of the few people out there. So they're going to have to go after them. They're also going to probably have to give them all the stuff he wanted. that The UFC didn't, Namely, rights to his own sponsors, maybe uh, uh, the right to go box. It's probably going to be an open contract that he can – and like the UFC where they said you have to be exclusive to us and then you can box afterwards, they're probably going to have to give him the right to go box. They've already said they're willing to do that. The other thing is unlike the UFC that wouldn't give up those extensions, they're probably going to have to make a contract that's much more in his favor where it's like I I fight a you know number of fights over this period of time and then I'm done. There's no extensions. They'll probably have to agree to that. The thing is PFL, neither PFL or Bellator, or any MMA promotion, I don't see them ever doing like the one-off because there's no big event right now you can hold with them that's worth just having a one-off. The value of Francis in MMA for these promoters right now is you have the number one fighter in the world heavyweight attached to your promotion. And so you're going to want more than a one-fight deal. You're probably going to want a multi-fight, like let's say three-fight deal minimum to get the value out of that or, or that he has to promote your brand for two years or something. It can't be a, just a one shot with him. And that's, that's unfortunate because, you know, with, with Nate Diaz, he could do the one shot fight, but in MMA and Gano can't. The other thing uh, in Gano, I guess the, with Bellator, the other option is Bellator can offer him some, they can offer him a little prestige because Ryan Bader is not like a serious challenge, but at least he's in the top 10, right? To say like, listen, okay, at least I'm fighting someone that has, that's in the ranking somewhere. 
So that's that's a positive for him. On top of that, Bellator has strong connections to boxing, and they've already made it clear we're going to offer him something he can do both. The, again, Bellator, though, is going to want to wait and see if hope that if they sign Nganu, they, maybe they have him fight Ryan Bader and then wait and see if other UFC fighters show up or they can start offering him boxing fights. But the other thing Bellator is going for him is they have connections to Ryzen. And so I could see, and I've talked to people, uh, an Nganu Overeem fight in Japan could probably do pretty good business. We, we talked about before that Ryzen does much more business than I think people in America are aware of. And so it's plausible that an offer that's in the ballpark of what he would get from Bellator, we're, we're talking $5 million, $6 million a fight right now with, with those promotions to offer, minimum, he could get that in Ryzen too. So that's that could be enticing for him, that we're going to – we also have this – you know, if we can't get a fight in Bellator, we can get you over to Ryzen and and cover that that nut. The other option, of course, is boxing for him. And, you know, we've they've talked about it already that they want to – if they sign him and got to do a Showtime Bellator, they want to get him against Deontay Wilder. They think that's a money fight. Uh, we've heard Dillian White challenge him. We heard uh, Misfits Boxing in uh, in England say we want to put him against Derek Chisora. And then finally we saw the big guy, Tyson Fury, just issued a new challenge against him. So there's interest in him in boxing. I don't think – I think some people have a fantasy that he's just going to fight uh, Fury and make, you know, 100 million, 30, 50 million, some ridiculous amount. I'm not I'm not 100 percent sold on Tyson's Fury's offer yet, but I do think Fury's kind of like maybe, you know, feeling the winds, testing the water to see how much interest is there. But there is interest in fighting in Ghana because the promoters know that, they're, that he's a name. We can generate money. We can have a big fight and our stars probably view it as, a, as an easy fight because he's not. He's not been a professional boxer. Mm -hmm. And so there is there is that chance that I do think there is a chance that he fights Fury. There is a chance. I mean, he was in Saudi Arabia. Why is he in Saudi Arabia? I don't know. But Saudi Arabia, as we know, mm -hmm. has it made it no secret that they are interested in putting on big boxing matches and combat sports as part of their sports washing. It's very possible they're putting together a package for Nganu versus uh, a boxing, uh, one of the top boxers, right? And one of these mixed events they want to talk about. So... He has that option. I don't know if it's going to be a mixed event or it's going to be, you know, a, a normal boxing match. But odds are, if I prefer he probably does the mixed event match first because he might be able to hold his own and then he can get a boxing match after that so he can get two cash outs in boxing. Mm -hmm. Because I got a feeling if he fights a Wilder or Joshua or Fury, he's going to lose and that might be the end of the show. But who knows? Maybe he lucks out and they, they carry him and make him look good and then he gets a second one. But in any case, he gets one of those big fights. He will make he'll make the eight figures probably there. He'll get his eight figure bout. I don't know. I don't know what the upside is. It's the the potential for Francis. The reason one of the reasons he probably did this left the UFC is there's no guarantee he will make more outside the UFC than he made in it. But the option to make a lot more is now available to him. Mm -hmm. In the UFC, it was denied. So. He's not going to like, if he signs with Belter or PFL, he's not going to make really less than he made in the UFC. They're going to pay him pretty close to what the UFC was paying him because they have to. And even if they lose money on the deal, they'll do it. But now the possibility of one of these mega fights, be it him fighting, you know, uh, uh, in, in boxing and making a lot of money, or potentially maybe luck out and one of the UFC fighters e exit the UFC and they get some big fight outside the UFC and they get to keep all the money, the option's now there. It's no longer denied to him, and and that's the benefit to him. So he's uh, – I don't want to say he's his options like he's guaranteed to make a lot more outside the UFC, but but he's not going to lose much. If, if the worst-case scenario, he's not going to lose much what he would have gotten in the UFC, and best-case scenario, that one of these fights will, will materialize, and he'll make a lot, lot, lot more than he ever would have in the UFC. Just to clarify, when you say that – that Bellator could pay him close to what the UFC was. You mean what the UFC would have paid, like this supposed legendary $8 million deal, not what he was making currently, like when he left. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. not the 600000 You know, it's it, one thing about MMA fans, you notice, is they either grossly exaggerate what mm -hmm. fighters are making or grossly underestimate. Right. They, they, they're they really off on the numbers. I mean, some fans are not, those that listen to us are very knowledgeable. You guys are great. But the rest of the fans are clueless. And the, the fact that they view like 600000 or a million dollars, oh, he's going to get a million dollars, which is a lot of, that's not a lot of money in no. combat sports for a guy of his caliber. No. Uh, I, I'm assuming that they offered him 
the eight billion was for the Jones fight, but I'm assuming, based on what I know about UFC contracts, how they paid that they're they were offering him about five, four to five million a fight, plus an upside on pay per view. That's what I'm assuming the UFC offered in Ganu, and then big fights like Jones would have made like eight to ten million. I am be I am fairly certain that PFL and and Bellator could offer him easily that amount. You know, maybe even more. Not that it'd be easy for them. It would it would strain their you know their their chat their their war chests, but they they desperately need fighters like him. And it's a there's a for PFL they desperately need him because they need stars to kick off this pay per view. For Bellator, you know Bellator people might not be aware, but a lot of Bellator fighters at the top of Bellator make more than the comparable fighter in the UFC. You know, that they're, they're, they're top lightweight, you know, number five in the world or whatever, or number 10 is making more than a similar position guy in the UFC. They're not making as much as the champs in the UFC, but they're paying them better than the guys, the next tier down challengers, basically the non pay-per-view attractions in the UFC Bellator for Bellator paying five to 6 million just to have Ngannou be the, you know, the, for, for a multi-fight deal, so five or six million a fight for multi fights to say we he is the face of Bellator we have the number one heavyweight it's probably worth it yeah because it it elevates the brand and you know with Showtime and stuff they can probably work out deals where the burden of that's not all the money's not just coming out of like Bellator's budget that they you know that they're they're going to give up you know like rights to uh, sponsorship sections of the cage or we have access you can have the rights to certain uh, media distribution for certain areas if you think you can make more there they they can they're much more you know because they come from they have a boxing experience too they're probably much more pliable uh in in, in negotiations going back to Francis Ngannou and boxing you know you mentioned Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder, Anthony Joshua, but there's some other names out there. And you mentioned one, Dillian White. Let me ask you about two others. One very, very famous uh, in Usyk. Uh, is there any opportunity for Francis to fight, say, an Oleksandr Usyk? And conversely, what kind of money could he make fighting, say, a Dillian White or even an Andy Ruiz? Well, with with Usyk, I think there's no there's no option right now because the the interest is the two giants, Fury versus Ngannou. People, I mean, there's a reason why Joshua Fury and Wilder keep coming up because it, it's just comic book. I mean, uh, yeah. S- Stephen Espinoza of Showtime Boxing, you know, head of Showtime Sports, there, he kind of said it. It's like Superman versus Batman. It's a Marvel comic thing, which would be Hulk versus Thing. You know, that just it it just looks right to see these monsters fight each other. Mm-hmm. But if Usyk beats Fury. I do think there's a chance. Let's say Usyk beats Fury, and let's say Saudi Arabia is interested in putting on this kind of this freak show fight. Well, then I think there is a chance that maybe Usyk enters the picture. Wow. You know, the the heavyweight, the uni- the the undisputed, and in, in boxing there really is an undisputed. Right. He'd be the undisputed boxing champion versus the number one heavyweight in MMA. That you know maybe they dish out some money for that, but I don't think uh, right now I don't think. Uh, uh, outside of that happening, I don't think there's much interest because Usyk doesn't doesn't check off the list of things that make it such an exciting, you know, interesting fight to fans to watch. Dillian White is another option, and I, I, I if I'm Ninganu, the first thing I'm doing, the first thing I'm doing is I'm making my own belt. Okay. I'm going out and I'm doing like you remember the, the Terminator trailers for Terminator Two, mm-hmm. and they or they did they showed the machines working and then the Terminator rose. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm doing that with a belt and it's my belt says number one heavyweight in the world because you want to remind people you're the number one heavyweight because the UFC is going to do everything they can to make people forget that. So that's the first thing. The second thing I do is I tr- if I'm doing a boxing fight, I probably look at the big names and try to get the biggest fights possible because there's no guarantee there's going to be a second fight if something happens. Now, if you can't get Wilder, if you because of whatever reason, if you can't get Fury or Joshua, then maybe I'm looking to, to Dillian White because White has a, a history. You know, he has some sort of fan base in UK. I think it's gone down a bit since he lost to uh, Fury, but it's still there might be some interest there. But I, I'm I'm probably not boxing him straight up because if you box him straight up and you lose, you've killed your other big fights. Maybe I do a kickboxing match because Dillian White used to kickbox. Dillian White was maybe I try to convince, I try to push out some money and get Dillian White into an MMA fight because Dillian White has some MMA experience. Mm. So there, Andy Ruiz, kind of the same. You don't, it just, I don't think it'd be the, it's, there's just not the two Titans going at it formula. Right. So you want to stick to the big guys first, you know, at first, but 
after a while, if you can't get those fights made, that's the one hurdle I think is going to happen for both Diaz and and Nganu is in MMA, there's very little negotiation in the sense we have a fighter under contract, we want to sign you under contract, let's make the fight. In boxing, there's a lot more moving parts. And so negotiations can be a lot harder. Mm -hmm. And so fights that make sense can make a lot of money. In fact, uh, top rank, uh, one of the top rank officials put a, put a gr made a great comment. When there's a lot of money to, ma to make in a fight, the, 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 the negotiations are fairly easy. When people think there's a lot of money in the fight, but there's not as much as they think, then it gets really difficult. Yeah. And so that's that's probably where we might get into some trouble. But if everybody, apparently a lot of people in boxing, even Al Heyman included, and if Al Heyman thinks that it's probably true, think there's money to make in a Nagano fight. You say that a return to the UFC is not unlikely for Nate. Could we ever see, uh, you know, Francis Ngannou return or is that scorched to earth because you know how the, the UFC kind of operates when situations like this happen. However, however, we have seen guys take off, join other promotions, acrimony is split from the UFC. I'm, I'm thinking of our Andre Arlovsky taking off to go to Affliction. You know, they were not happy with that, but he got to come back. Uh, we, we've seen that, you know, for, for a long time, we, we didn't get to see Vitor Belfort come back because there was some, some falling out or whatever. And then, you know, Vitor's back, et cetera. So do we ever have an option to maybe see Ngano come back to the UFC or is that just a done deal? You think? No, I, I think it's possible he comes back. He he said it himself. I mean, Tito Ortiz is the most famous example where, you know, yes, there you Dana, go. Dana White despised the man and Tito Ortiz despised Dana White. And yet they kept coming back. You know, they'd work together. Tito would leave. He'd come back. They worked together. Tito would leave. Tito tried to come back again. So they they would they worked together even after scorch, the scorched earth they had. And God was nowhere near as bad. If Ngato leaves, just starches some heavyweights outside the UFC. Uh, maybe one fighter from the UFC leaves and fights him. He starches that guy. So he retains his position at the top of the heavyweight division and goes in boxes and doesn't get absolutely embarrassed. Well, his name value is only going to get bigger, right? Right. His, his Q rating is going to increase. At that point, the UFC might say, we would love to have you back. And, and you know, maybe Ngannou says, hey, can we have these new contract terms? Maybe by that point, the UFC is like, yes, we're willing to now work differently. Or maybe the UFC says, you know, this is we want to sign you at the end of your career. Here's a here's a really big deal, but we want to lock you in now. And Ngannou's like, well, I did my boxing. I did, I'm willing to sign this this deal with these ex provisions now because I, this, I plan to only do two more fights, let's say. I think that's plausible. That's very plausible that that could happen. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think that about covers our topic for today. Do you have any ending comments or should I wrap it up? We, I guess we can wrap it up. I guess the only note is uh, if people are interested, I post this on my own uh, website, YouTube later with visual graphics. So the, you know, it's out the audio for a while. And then at some point, whenever I get a, a chance, I post a video that puts up in case you get lost in the contracts and stuff and whatever clause I'm commenting. Sometimes I'll, I try to put some of the, you know, the text up and stuff to help people follow along. Awesome. See, you're getting double dip time here with John Nash. I love that. Extra. Double double dip time. That's dip uh, time. I, that, that's that was an adult movie I watched once. <laughs> and for those of you that don't know, John actually worked in the porn industry for a little bit. I did not. I worked in soft porn, soft porn. That's uh, I did never worked out of the minors into the into the majors. That's uh, <laughs> okay. Still porn. Is it, was, it was it was Skinamax TNA. A little different. Little yeah. Let's. I'm not. I'm not Eugene here. But I did have a lot because of the people you work with in that. You, I had a lot of run-ins with the the porn industry back in the day. Oh, we're gonna have to have a Q and A just about that one of these days. But until then, we gotta wrap this one up. So do me a favor. Follow this guy on social media. He only has one social media that you can access. That is Twitter. So he is Hey Not The Face on Twitter, but he does have a YouTube. I don't really consider YouTube social media though. I consider that like streaming media. It's, I don't know, it just seems different. I'm sure it is social media, but I just categorize it myself in a different little subset. So anyways, he is Hey Not The Face on YouTube as well. Am I correct? Um, I know on YouTube, I'm, I'm, I'm John S. Nash on YouTube. See, look at me. 
Screw Wait, am, I, you know, I got, I don't even know what I am on YouTube. Are you? No, I'm pretty sure. I have, I might, hold on a second. Let's go to my YouTube See, channel. Now, now we have to go and fix this. Well, I just, you, you threw me for a curve. I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was not ready totally for my YouTube channel. This part in so that they can hear our two old asses. Bump. No, you know what? Just cut off the part where I got it wrong. Cause I am, I'm John S. Nash on YouTube. No, I'm not going to cut that out. Absolutely oh. not. You didn't okay. know what your own YouTube was, and I think well, people gee, need this to is know a, that. this is just this is not called for your producer. You're supposed to make me look good. I do all the time, but every once in a while, I'm going to sneak something in. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> this one's not so sneaky, though. Anywho, yeah. he is John S. Nash on YouTube, and Hey Not the Face on Twitter. So check him out there. And until next time, please stay safe. It's not in the face! Thank you.